What's up, Prime Fam? What's going on, guys? Today, we're gonna talk about how to find your optimal volume for uh, programming. Now, a lot of the rules and the hard numbers I'm gonna give you today are gonna be more in line with submaximal GP programming, the way I program. Uh, that's not to say this won't apply to other styles of programming though. So for instance, if you program in more like what I call like American style programming, like lower frequencies, uh, maybe still DUPE, but just lower frequencies and higher exertion, the rules may change a little bit for that or if you do like a West Side, like conjugate style of programming or whatever. However, um, definitely anyone using higher frequency templates, especially with DUP, are probably gonna find these rules to be true. Now before I even get into the hard numbers, let's define optimal and let's define volume. What I'm gonna talk about today is hard working sets because depending on if you're in a strength block or a hypertrophy block or whatever it may be, you're probably gonna find that your uh, number of hard sets is relatively the same from block to block. The thing that changes is your total volume in the amount of reps and the amount of weight on the bar. So when we define volume in a scientific standard, uh, the way they do in most scientific research, they're gonna say sets times reps times weight and that equates to a total workload of tonnage. Now, I think I think there's a time and place to calculate volume like that, but I think when speaking in terms of programming, we should think more about um, hard working sets. Also guys, forgive me, I'm in a live gym. I can't ask everyone to stop lifting or anything like that. So if there's noise in the background, just bear with me. So that's what we define volume as. Now let's define optimal. Optimal is going to refer to maximal strength and hypertrophy adaptations, depending on really what you're training for in that block, while ensuring tissue tolerance stays high. So meaning we're not overworking our tissues, not accumulating injuries. So basically, to me, optimal is going to be what we can sustain for long periods of time while we're getting as strong as possible. Now, there's styles of programming out there. Some of you may have ran something like a PH3 program, which gets you really strong really quick, you know, in that 12 or 16 weeks or whatever it was. But then you find you've accumulated a ton of injuries after it and you have to like restart after the program. So to me, that's not optimal because that's not sus uh, sustainable. For me, I am really big. If anyone follows me on Instagram with my clients, they know I like to pair training cycles back to back to back one after the other I really try to avoid injuries and in training because I think that is the biggest thing that sets powerlifters back so let's get into the hard numbers first I'm gonna give you my low-end numbers and my high-end numbers for what I um, do with my powerlifting clients most of you are probably gonna fall in between these numbers I got my phone out here because I didn't want to mess up any of the hard numbers so the lowest I've almost ever programmed someone in the last couple years of programming in a submax GP style on squats 9 to 11 sets is probably going to be the safe low end to start your programming at and then build from there. So I haven't gone really less than nine except for in rare uh, circumstances of injury. So that's going to be for squat. For the deadlift, six to eight sets of deadlifts per week. Excuse me, that's what I should be saying here. Both of these are, all these numbers are going to be in a weekly fashion. And I think it's important to look at this because most people line their micro cycles in a training week. Uh, for bench press, it's going to be 11 to 13 sets of bench per week. So these are the lowest amount of set ranges that I usually give out. And those are for my like responders that get a lot out of a little bit and tend to accumulate injuries if they go above that. Now on the high end, I've given out as many as 25 to 30 sets of squats in a training block to clients before. And that's just of squatting, not including accessory and, and other uh, movements. That does include variation, but 25 to 30 sets of close barbell squat variations or the comp squat itself. 15 sets of deadlifts per week and 35 sets of bench per week. I've never gone above that with any client before and those are again very rare circumstances. Most of you are going to find your volume allotments in the amount of hard working sets you can handle per week in the range uh, between these two numbers. I wanted to give some hard concrete numbers for you guys to deal with and then for you to kind of uh, figure out where you may be in the spectrum. What I would recommend is always to start on the low end, especially if you're newer to higher frequency style programming in a submax fashion that I do, and then build your way slowly using some of the guidelines I'm gonna give you next. Now, how do we determine if the volume we're doing in our program is optimal? Really, the best way to do it is to just try, but then to track certain markers of progress from week to week. What I want you to do is actually track your squat top sets, especially, or your uh, bench top sets or your deadlift top sets on your strength oriented day so say you're squatting three times a week maybe you have a strength day a hypertrophy day and then a recovery volume day like you guys have seen me use with my clients before that strength day is going to be the lowest acute fatigue day so it's going to show your fitness the best and i think it's a good marker of progress to track to see if you're responding to the volume well now if your top sets are increasing by about two to three percent 
uh, weekly with an increase in RP. So usually when we go through a training block, most of you will know it starts off pretty easy in the beginning of a training block and gets harder. Maybe we have triples in a training block starting at RP6 and by the end of the training block we get up to RP9 with each week increasing by one RPE. What we want to search for is a two to three percent increase at minimum from week to week when the RP goes up. So say we do a triple on squats at RP6 week one and week two we do a triple at RP7. We should see a minimum increase of two to three percent on the bar. Now that would be for maintaining strength and showing you're at least semi recovering from the volume. However, to show true adaptation, we want to see closer to about a four to five percent increase. The, the reason being here is we know every increase in percentage or load on the bar by two to three percent usually shaves off about a rep. So if we increase the RP by one, we're going to know that um, we should see an increase in weight by about two to three percent. And so that would mean we're getting not really any strength gains from it, but no strength loss. However, if we're seeing true strength gains, we may see as high as a four to five percent increase from week to week, and that's what you want to be searching for. Now, if you're getting less than two to three percent, if you're getting you know below two percent. Uh, on a weekly increase on those strength days, you're probably not recovering well from your volume, which could mean you're just really new to the style of programming and maybe you need to give it a couple of weeks to catch up. However, after about two weeks of plateauing, by that third week, if stuff hasn't fixed, that's usually a sign your volume or your exertion or something along those lines is too high. More often than not, it's gonna be your volume. So this is the first marker of progress that I'm tracking to see if I'm responding to the volume well. Now let me use me as an example to kind of track this progress through my initial training block that you guys have actually been watching me carry out on YouTube. Those of you who know, uh, I started a new training cycle and the very first training block I actually just completed. And I wanna show my strength squat day top sets from week one to week four. And I'm gonna explain the program uh, for those of you who missed the previous video. I started doing sets of four on this day at RP6 for my top set at week one. Week two was sets of four at RP7. Week three was triples at RP7, so a set of three at RP7. And the final week was a triple at RP8. So by each week, it either increased an RP by one or increased by, uh, or decreased by a rep by um, one. So what this allowed me to do was incrementally load at least an extra two to 3% on the bar weekly. However, that's not what happened because I was responding well to the program. We saw larger increases. Week one, I squatted 473 pounds for my top set of four. Um, it was supposed to be actually a top set of four. I had to stop at uh, two reps because I felt some pain in my adductor. However, it would have been accurate to the RPE because I know my body really well and I had done a few build-up sets before that. Uh, week two, I squatted 495 for my top set uh, and that was a set of four at RP7. And then uh, week three, I actually got up to 540 pounds for my triple at RP7. And then the final week, I squat 562 pounds for a triple at RP8, uh, which was actually probably uh, would have been a lot better had I not been feeling that adductor again that I strained in week one. So each week, I increased actually more than the 2 to 3% range, especially towards the end of the block. So I know I was responding well to the programming. My secondary and tertiary squat days, the volume days, actually also increased from uh, week to week by more than 2%, but that was just kind of an extra bonus showing that I was really responsive to this training. Those days I don't focus on as much. Now I wanna use a different example, someone like my client Liam. We encountered early on in his programming that he could handle a lot of volume, and we actually found we were underdosing him on volume and overdosing him on exertion. So after we got through a little plateau, after we saw some initial gains in our training, we were trying to figure out what was going on, and then we dosed him with more volume, but actually less uh, exertion because we were following that two week rule. I saw two weeks of stagnant progress, the third week he came in, stuff still wasn't looking right, and so I decided to change the programming. I upped his volume, but dropped his exertion. What we got from that was a great training block. It was the first time he ever broke into a 500 pound squat, which was a huge milestone for him. Before coming to me, he never squatted over 463 in the gym. And his week one of that training block, he squatted 452. Week two, he squatted 471. Week three, he squatted 485. And then the final week, he squatted 500, probably easier than he squatted the 485 the week before that. So it was a huge training block for him and he was very productive. And again, what we were doing was searching for his responsiveness through tracking his top sets. Now, this same rules can be applied for the bench press and the deadlift, but to an extent. There's a little rule with the deadlift. Now, especially for my conventional bowlers, 
they tend to fatigue hard. And what I see are kind of bi-weekly, sometimes tri-weekly higher performances on deadlifts and a lot of weeks of fatigue. There's something about the deadlift that it just seems to fatigue a lot harder than the other lifts. I've heard people debate that recently. I disagree with this. I've been coaching for a very long time. The one thing I see with all my lifters, especially even if they're running lower volumes on the deadlift, it still seems to fatigue harder than the other lifts, especially for my conventional pullers. For my really upright sumo pullers, not as much. They can usually handle about as much sumo volume as they can squat volume as long as their hips can take it. However, um, for the deadlift, I want to show you my top sets throughout this training block again. So this was followed right after my squats on that initial strength day. Um, my first week, and it followed the same undulation pattern uh, of reps and sets and uh, RP as my squat did. The very first week I hit 551 on the deadlift for a set of four. Week two, I barely mustered up 551 for a set of four again. So I actually saw zero increase from week to week, but I didn't panic because I knew my deadlift kind of does that sometimes. Then week three, I came in to hit a 595 pound deadlift for a triple which was huge for me and then the final week I finished with a triple at 617 pounds and those were all on the stiff bars so they're actually really big sets for me um, and so I didn't panic and I and that, again that two week rule really comes into play and for deadlifts it might be more like three to four weeks because I do expect some fatigue throughout the training weeks a little bit more on the deadlift especially with conventional pulling. I also tend to look at the deadlift in a more bigger picture. Even after this training block I hit 639 pounds and 661 pounds uh, for big PR sets uh, going into the next training block right after the higher RPE uh, triple at the end of the first training block. So even there um, it seems like my deadlift is back on a gain train and I didn't panic after it didn't increase from week to week in the very first one. There's definitely such a thing as uh, manipulating too much. You want to be dynamic with your programming, alter things as you kind of find out patterns. However, you have to make sure it's a pattern first before you alter it. Now, some rules of thumb to follow when you're tracking this stuff. First off, one, be sure you're not overshooting or undershooting because that will highly skew your um, you know, tracking of these markers of progress. So what I mean by that is if you do a squat set of four at RP6 week one, but it's really more like RP4, and then week two, you push it a little bit more for that next RP7 you know, set of four, you may increase the load on the bar a lot more, but it's really just because you're undershooting the first week. This is where it becomes very in hand it becomes very handy to know your RPs. My RPs are very different looking on camera than someone else's. I've had an entire video on this demonstrating on my bench press how quickly I die out both on the squat and bench press in my RPs. They look deceptively fast on camera. And so that kind of comes to my next point. You can definitely overshoot too. You're going to just screw up your progress and you can't really track anything if you're not actually sticking to the program as written. So if you're seeing um, that your progress is not increasing from week to week, it may be because you're undershooting or over shooting so ensure you're staying on program correctly. Rule number two is going to be whenever you're fresh out of meat prep expect actually larger week to week increases. The reason why is uh, the novelty of volume again. Most people going into meets may be doing uh, they maybe do like sets of one two or three maybe they have one day of sets of five but we're not usually doing a lot of volume and when I say volume in this circumstance I'm speaking about sets times reps times weight this time. So a lot of like repetitions on the bar a lot more total workload. Our work capacity is very low going into a meet prep. We're really good at doing singles and heavy stuff, but we're usually pretty bad at doing those sets of seven or nines or whatever on squats. So when we're fresh out of the meat prep and we start doing those sets of sevens and nines again, we're going to quickly adapt to that. So no longer is it just strength uh, adaptations. We're also seeing work capacity adaptations. So you may find that week one, it's really hard to do that set of seven on squats, but week two and three gets easier and easier to do it as you adapt to that new stimulus that you haven't had in a while. So ensure that when you're tracking fresh out of the meat prep, that like you're not um, overestimating your abilities by those weekly increases because you will see larger increases when you're uh, doing something novel. That brings me to rule number three. Whenever it's a new exercise that you've never done before or haven't done in a long time, you're again going to see uh, bigger strength adaptations from week to week. And again, it's not really strength adaptations. It's more neural adaptations, which goes hand in hand with strength. But I'm talking about that baseline neural adaptation where you're just getting better technique. For instance, if you haven't high bar squatted in a while and the first week you're getting bent over like a stripper and you're kind of pitching your chest forward, you may find the weeks after that you do a little bit better staying upright and in the quads coming out of the hole. So the novelty of exercise or even your training program can actually increase uh, adaptations a little bit quicker. So keep that in mind when you're judging from week to week before you get too hasty and think you're Superman and give yourself too much volume because it looks so good on paper with how much you're responding. Rule number four is going to be to always ensure there's a hierarchy of fitness 
tightness and fatigue in your program. So what I mean by that is those of you who've followed me for a long time know that I usually squat or bench at least three times a week, sometimes at a higher frequency. There's gonna be days where your squat feels better and where your squat feels worse. And you have to systematically plan for this ahead of time within the programming itself. That's a whole video for another time, but what we're talking about here is acute fatigue. So certain days we want our squat to feel really good and other days we're gonna expect our squat to feel a little bit worse, however not horrible. Um, and what we wanna do is to align our training days to always follow this pattern. So usually my strength-based days, my number one like heaviest day of the week, I'm always gonna ensure my fatigue is the lowest and my fitness is the highest. The secondary and tertiary days or maybe even a, a fourth training day of squats a week or whatever exercise it may be, I may expect higher fatigue. Now on that main day, we want to use that as the tracker of progress, to, to track the markers of progress. Now if your fatigue is fluctuating all over the place, you're not going to be able to track this. You may have that day feel great, and then your tertiary day feels great, and then the secondary the next week day feels great, and, and so it's all over the place and it's hard to track if you're actually making progress. This is where understanding your body's acute fatigue and how to program around it really comes into play. Now finally, I want to get into some rules uh, surrounding just programming in a submax DUP style in general so you can kind of know when it's like the volume that's the problem or when it's something else and these rules are very important to understand otherwise you can get kind of misconstrued in your analysis of the uh, program and your responsiveness so what I mean by that is maybe the volume isn't the, pro the problem but maybe it's because your exertion is too high or maybe your intensity is too high or maybe you have too many strength days and not enough of like lower exertion lower volume days or whatever it may be you want to ensure that the volume is the problem and not something else so these are the rules I want you to follow. No more, no more than six weekly sets of main movements at RP8 or higher, and rarely do I do more than three weekly sets above RP8. So this may surprise a lot of people, but to get really strong at powerlifting, you don't have to go to failure. So I very rarely program sets at RP8 uh, more than about three to six times a week in a training, uh, in a training week, in a micro cycle. So say uh, day one, we have some squats, uh, triples at RP8, followed by some deadlifts at uh, RP8, and then some um, you know, bench at RP8. At most, I might have one other day where we hit another three sets of those lifts uh, at RP8 uh, or a little bit higher. It's very rare I program more than that. Usually speaking, most of my training uh, or my client's training is done at RP7 or less, except for the final week or two in a training block. If you're doing a lot of RP8 and you're training from week to week, you may make progress in the short term, but I promise you're either gonna burn out, hit plateaus, or worst case, get injured. I do not believe in doing higher exertion programs. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna disagree with that. I know there's different training styles out there, but this is the way I, I program. Now, mind you, I'm also programming most of my clients anywhere from 15 to 20-ish sets of squats a week. So it's a little bit different when you're doing that high of volume. That's not to say the reverse couldn't work with higher exertion and lower volume. I just find this tends to be better for my style and I've tried a lot of the styles of programming over the years. Rule number two is going to tie into rule number one. Usually stay below RP8 the first two to three weeks of a training block. For bench press you might get away with a little bit more but definitely on deadlifts for sure. If you're doing more than two weeks of RP8 or higher on the deadlift you're probably going to get burnt out pretty quick. Rule number three might be one of the most important rules on this entire list and that's to always ensure you never increase by more than 25% volume, total volume and I mean weekly sets here than what you were previously doing last training cycle. So say we go through a whole training cycle or say you're very new to submax GP programming, you may have never been able to, uh, you may have never even done like 10 sets of squats a week, let alone 20. So a lot of guys, they get overzealous and they get like really big eyes when they look at the style of programming, they wanna go hard and maybe they've been doing 5-3-1 or something before, which might accumulate, you know, six to eight hard sets of squats a week, if that, and then all of a sudden they hop on the submax GP program or they go do PH3 and they're doing like 20 hard sets of squats a week. Almost always do we see like a huge uh, increase in injury rates when that happens. I've seen this a thousand times. In fact, I've gotten a lot of people who come to me after doing that, complaining about injuries, and then they realize they need someone to help them out with their coaching. So what I would recommend is always never, uh, to, to never increase by more than 25% total volume. So if you're doing 10 sets of squats a week, you don't want to add more than about three more sets to that per week uh, until you acclimate to it. And then after a few training blocks of that, you can increase by a little bit more. Guys, remember, you don't need to jump up to the highest amounts of volume right out of the gates. Keep it low and get gains out of that while you can and then increase as you need to throughout the training blocks. You can also systematically deload and kind of um, 
like detrain your nervous system from handling a certain amount of sets of squats. That way you're more primed to handle a little bit less in the future and still get growth from that. Rule number four is if you're thinking you're handling this volume really well and you could actually handle a little bit more for gains if you're tracking your weekly markers and every day just feels kind of easy and you feel like you're underworking, then I would say to increase your uh, volume gradually. Add no more than about 10 to 15% total volume to your training program a week. And you can increase by week to week until you find your sweet spot and where everything seems to level out. If you increase by dramatic amounts, if all of a sudden you just add another five whopping sets of squats on top of your already you know, 12 sets of squats you're doing per week, you're probably gonna find that you go from feeling really good to really shitty really quickly, so increase gradually. Rule number five is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, decrease your volume, and again, gradually. You don't need a huge decrease, but decrease your volume gradually whenever you plateau for more than two or three weeks at a time, especially for the squat and bench press. So if we're not seeing weekly increases from week to week and it feels like you're stagnating and your top sets are getting harder as the weeks go on, I would decrease your volume by about maybe 15 to 20%. Uh, and then see how that goes for the next couple of weeks and then decrease more if needed. There is such a thing as detraining too though. You don't want to just drop all your volume off if you're you know, squatting maybe 15 sets a week instead of going all the way down back to like you know, eight sets or something. Instead, let's just try to do 12 sets of squats a week and see how you recover from that. You'd be shocked how little changes go a long way. Rule number six, Sometimes don't fuck with anything. If responsiveness is really high, that might be a really good thing. You don't necessarily need to increase your volume. It's more when we actually see kind of stagnation, maybe early responsiveness, and then all of a sudden the volume got too easy and you're stagnating, that's when we want to increase. But if you're constantly gaining from week to week to week throughout the training cycle of you know five months or however long your training cycle is, there's no need to actually increase volume more. You're already doing good. Don't get into that Superman kind of mode where you want to just do as much as possible to eke every little bit of gains out because oftentimes that just leads to stagnation anyway. Rule number seven, most higher RP sets should be safe for your primary strength day. So that lowest to acute fatigue day. The other days, I might increase the uh, RPs a little bit towards the end of the block, but most of the time I'm falling in that six to eight RP range and really more that six to seven. I like to save the higher exertion days for that primary strength day. Rule number eight and the final rule I'm gonna give you guys is to always ensure you're wave loading every four to five weeks. If you don't wave load in some form or at least deload, which again, I don't like deloads unless they're needed, you're gonna find that you stagnate very quickly. So you can't just keep increasing your percentages week to week, even if it's set up to where you're not going to failure. You you want to wave load, you want to have uh, peaks and valleys for your program. Say you're starting here at a 500 pound squat and you want to get to that 600 pound squat, on the way to it, it's not just going to be straight up unless you're a beginner who just happened to squat 500 pounds their first time. Usually mo most of you guys are going to be starting there as intermediate or advanced power lifters and to get there you're going to need a wave up and down. You're going to have peaks of intensity and exertion and then valleys, but over the course of that time it's going to reach that peak of that 600 pound squat. Get there gradually, wave load, be smart. That's pretty much it for the uh, the programming video. What I want to announce at the end of this, because I want to give out free information, but I know a lot of you guys don't know how to do this yourself. If you watched until the end, and this is why I saved this announcement for the end of the video, you're probably the tr kind of trainee I'm looking for. I'm going to do a larger announcement video for this, but I, uh, me and my girlfriend both, who have gotten a ton of great results with our clients uh, the last few years of doing this, we actually are opening up spaces for coaching. I know a lot of you have emailed me over the last couple years. It's rare I actually announce uh, spaces for coaching. Usually it's like once a year that I actually publicly announce on YouTube or you get really lucky and email me at the right time that someone else left. We will be taking on clients. I will be detailing in a future video exactly um, how we go about our coaching process, what style programming we do. I know a lot of you already know that. Um, and just what we're looking for because what, what Chris and I are looking for are actually clients that um, are really dedicated to powerlifting. Now, there's a time and place for, for coaching lifters who aren't as, you know, live, eat, and breathe powerlifting as we are, but we're actually really looking for a lot of serious powerlifters. It doesn't matter if you're weak or strong, if you're dedicated to the sport of powerlifting, you want to try to get to, you know, national someday, you really want to give it your best, and that's what you're looking for, come to us, hit me up in my email, I'm going to provide it on the screen and in the description box below. Shoot me an email and I'll shoot you over a bunch of information on how I coach, our packages, and things like that. You can also reach my girlfriend at this email on the screen, and I'll also put her information down below. Um, she's actually, ironically, most female coaches get a ton of females, 
but she's gotten a lot of males, so she's actually looking for more female clients. You guys have seen Adrienne and her progress with Kristen in just a short six weeks. She's already hit way, way over her old maxes, uh, and she's done really great herself. So I really wanna get uh, both of us solidified for this next year, especially going into uh, USAPL Nationals. We both have about a combined 18 lifters going to Nationals this year, and we wanna get even more lifters on that docket. So if you're interested, let us know in the comment section below, shoot me an email. And if you guys have any other questions about the video, feel free to uh, tune in down below. Give us some comments, like the video, share the video. And until next time, I'll see you guys later.